Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today's program is an interesting one. Our guest, James Montier, tells us about fear and market psychology and value, three things every investor ought to be thinking about right now. You'll want to hear more. Your emails always add value, including superfan Joe V today with a great email in response to last week's show. If you didn't hear Enrique Abeda from last week, you should go back and listen to it. And as always, my rant. This week, I'll talk about enormous changes in the food, oil, and restaurant industries and what I think comes next for each. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. All right, let's talk about a few industries that are heavily impacted, including one that I think could create some real societal issues starting, oh, I don't know, right this minute. So this letter on Sunday appeared in a couple of newspapers, New York Times, and on the website of the company Tyson Foods, right? The big meat processing company. And you've probably seen Tyson brands at the grocery store. So John Tyson, chairman and CEO of Tyson Foods, wrote a letter on Sunday. And he basically alerted the country of an impending shortage of meat. And by association, we just took this as an impending shortage of food because what can affect the production of meat can affect the production of all food, right? And I'll just quote you one little passage that kind of sums up the, the problem here. And Tyson wrote, farmers across the nation simply will not have anywhere to sell their livestock to be processed when they could have fed the nation. Millions of animals, chickens, pigs, and cattle will be depopulated because of the closure of our processing facilities, end quote. So these are essential businesses, these meat processing facilities, but they're closing them because people are getting the coronavirus. They're getting sick, so they had to close them. And they closed a bunch of them. So you got all these animals that are mature and ready for slaughter, and there's no place to send them. So what do they do? Well, depopulated is, you know, there's all these euphemistic terms, euthanization and depopulation. They kill them without eating them is what happens. They're wasted. And, you know, I, I mean, I have a soft heart for animals. I'm no vegetarian, okay? But we, we bring these animals into the world and raise them up and care for them so that we can eat them. And it's tragically sad to see them killed without being eaten. It makes their lives, you know, it's like they lived and died in vain. I watched a Canadian farmer on Bloomberg TV Monday morning, openly emotional, talking about this and talking about having farmers having to euthanize thousands of animals at a time. It's, it's terrible. He was more concerned. It was more than just the lost revenue and investment, although that's, you know, that's a big impact too. It was just the thought of all these animals, as I say, having lived and died in vain. It's, it's heartbreaking. You know, and these are essential businesses, and, and yet they're still having to close down because people are getting the virus. And Tyson said, this is the thing that got me. He just said, the food supply chain is breaking. The food supply chain is breaking. That's scary. You know, you and I, we're, you know, we're big time investors or whatever. We got plenty of money in our 401ks or wherever. You know, we got resources we can tap. And if things cost a little more or get expensive, we can probably still afford it. But poor people who don't have anything to their name, they won't be able to afford it and they won't be able to get it. The supplies will be gone from the stores. Anybody who can get it will pay a fortune. And people are going to start getting hungry, I I'm afraid. You know, at first people will say, okay, well, here I am. I'm poor. I don't have a penny to my name. Put yourself in their shoes. What are they going to do? They're going to be like, I'm going to steal this. I'm going to get food any way that I can. That's bad enough. But my fear is that this goes on and on and on and the government doesn't let us go back to work soon enough. And then we start seeing like mass violence, you know. 
I don't want to see that. You don't want to see that. Nobody but the craziest people in our society want to see that. And this is like, this is the leading edge of that. And I pray, if you think I'm being overly dramatic, I pray that you're right. But man, this one thing, this one industry, it scares the bejeebers out of me. I feel like our way of life, it's one thing to have a severe recession or even a depression, but for our way of life to break down, to be shut down like this, I think it's probably harder to restart than people understand, you know, beyond a certain point, if, you, if it goes on long enough. And you can see this in the next market I'll talk about, which is fossil fuels. And fossil fuels, that, that's at the heart of every developed country. It's like the blood, you know, the circulatory system of a, of a developed economy. And the shutdown globally has destroyed demand. I saw a map this morning on Twitter of tankers filled to the brim with oil because there's no place to put it on land, hugging every coastline of every continent. All in the Gulf of Mexico, all up and down and around the coast of Africa, all up and down and around the coast of North and South America. It looked crazy. It looked like a bunch of little bugs about to invade the continents. It looks crazy. It's all these tankers just filled to the brim with crude oil. But hey, no problem, right? We start the economy back up. We get going again. We just crank up oil production and away we go. Everything's fine. Well, not so fast. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal earlier this week, and it focused on offshore producers. The offshore producers have begun shutting down, and they, they're saying they might not return to the market for many years. And the suggestion was that it's unrealistic to view crude oil production like some kind of a kitchen faucet where you turn it on and off in an instant. So the offshore producers, you know, they, they shut in for, you know, a few days at a time sometimes when they get a hurricane or something. But the way they're talking now, they're shutting in like 80, 90, 100 percent of their production, some of these companies, because low oil prices hit them a little harder. The offshore producers need a premium price to justify the extra transportation to get the crude oil into onshore refineries, you see? So, you know, when the price goes negative, 12 bucks or whatever it is now, it really hits them harder. And they're saying, they quoted this one guy from Talos Energy, the CEO of Talos Energy and offshore producer, Tim Duncan. And he said, in offshore, we don't shut in fields, we shutter them. You begin the process of leaving them forever, right? So the implication there is we can't just start this stuff up like turning the kitchen faucet back on. And this is meaningful now because offshore producers account for a record 15% of U.S. oil production before the virus hit, right? Last year, 15%. So if enough of that production capacity disappears, if most of it disappears, Here's what I think could happen next in the crude oil market that nobody is really anticipating right now with all these tankers in the water and prices at rock bottom lows and we saw negative prices. What nobody is thinking right now is that we could rapidly go from a glut to a shortage, right? The cure for low prices is low prices. That's what they always say about any commodity. And it's true. When people are shutting in production because there's no way they can continue to operate, that eventually creates the shortage that is necessary to get the price back up so that they can turn the production back on and produce at some kind of profitable level. So nobody's thinking that right now. I promise you, though, look, if oil can go from – if it can start the year at $61 a barrel and drop to negative 40 it can soar back from negative 40 to 61 really fast. Nobody's thinking about that. And that's not great. I mean, it's great if you're an oil speculator, I guess. But that's not necessarily a great thing. Extremely volatile prices aren't what oil companies need to see. They need to see steady higher prices. You know, if, if the price just soars back to 60 real fast, they won't necessarily open up all this shut-in production, you see? So this situation, this shutting down of everything, it has created these huge imbalances. And once things go badly out of whack in one direction, oh, well, then they go badly out of whack in the other direction. You can't operate in either environment in a lot of businesses. 
And you can see this in the essential business, so-called essential businesses. But let me tell you something about essential businesses. You, I'm saying you can see it in the essential businesses because they're still operating, right? But there's no such thing as a non-essential business. That's a huge, that's one of the biggest myths of this whole episode. There's no such thing as a non-essential business. Every business puts a roof over someone's head and food on someone's table. They're all essential. And more to the point, they're all interconnected. There was a fantastic letter in the Wall Street Journal recently. It was titled, it was in the opinion section of the Wall Street Journal, if you, if you get a subscription. Bad government is killing small businesses. And it was this guy, this restaurant owner from Michigan, Alan Van Dyke, and he wrote in, and he and his three kids are partners in two brew pubs in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they gave some numbers. They got 59, you know, before the virus, of course, 59 full and part-time employees. They spend 120 grand a month on payroll. They spend 130 a month at their 130 grand a month at their vendors. And they're shut down. They were ordered to shut down the restaurant on March 16th. They kept the takeout and delivery open, but now that's shut down too. And guess what? They're still on the hook for $50,000 a month in rent and utilities and a few other things. And this guy, Van Dyke, he said, you know, the chain reaction impact on their employees, vendors, landlord, the lenders at the bank. He finished up his letter with an old nursery rhyme. And he, he said, this is a quote from the letter. He says, the old nursery rhyme says that for want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, a horse was lost, and so on until a kingdom was lost. Let's not lose the nail, right? That's what an economy is. By that analogy, it's a w interconnected web of nails and shoes and horses, right? You, you can't separate any of them. You can't say, it's okay if we don't operate these million businesses over here. They're non-essential. The essentialness of those businesses due to the interconnected nature of an, of an advanced economy the essentialness is a law of nature. You cannot break laws of nature. You can only break yourself and everyone around you against them if you try to violate them. And that's what we're doing. We're violating the interconnectedness of an economy by saying these are non-essential, these are essential. They're all essential. And we're witnessing that now. If you want to get the classic statement of this, you read a piece by a guy named Leonard Reed, R-E-A-D, it's a classic essay. It's called I Pencil. Yes, I Pencil is what it's called. And he writes the thing from the viewpoint of the pencil. And, and he says, no single human being knows how to make a pencil. And it sounds like a ridiculous statement until you read through. And he describes what he calls the pencil's innumerable antecedents, which is just all the stuff that happens before you actually get a pencil in your hand. And he starts with the tree. A cedar tree that grows, he wrote this thing in 1958. So at that time, he said, the cedar tree grows in Northern California and Oregon. And then he says, now contemplate all the saws and trucks and rope and the other countless gear used in harving, harvesting and carting the cedar logs to the railroad siding. Think of all the persons and the numberless skills that went into their fabrication, the mining of ore, the making of steel, refinement into saws, axes, motors, the growing of hemp and bringing it through all the stages to heavy and strong rope logging camps with their beds and mess halls and cookery and the raising of all the foods. Why, untold thousands of persons had a hand in every cup of coffee the loggers drink. And that the thing continues through every step of the way. And then, you know, you just become aware, wow, the interconnectedness just to put a freaking pencil in my hand. It's pretty amazing. And of course, his point is, it's it's an economic essay. So his point is, we do, none of this happened by central planning. It just happened by people voluntarily interacting. And when people aren't allowed to voluntarily interact like that, we get what we're looking at, which is a crude oil market that is so insane, even if the price shoots back up, we may have a big problem having enough supply. And a food market that could send people rioting in the streets if we let this go on for another couple of months etc. You see? And you can see the ripples in the restaurant industry, as Alan Van Dyke described in his letter, right? The chain reaction, employees, vendors, landlords, lenders, right? And the, of course, the landlord, all, all of these people, all of the employees and the vendors and the landlord, they have lenders too, right? 
It's not just the restaurant lenders. And frankly, they all have vendors. And they many of them have landlords. It's just, it's an interconnected web. There's no such thing as an, a non-essential business. And when you think about it, Ray Dalio made a statement recently on a video. I tried to find it again. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't find it for you. Just try to Google around. He said, it seems to me like things are more than, at the time, I think he said 15% broken, meaning the market was actually only 15% below its high at that point. I think it's about 12 or 13% below as I'm talking to you. So things seem a little more than 12 or 13% broken, and indeed they are. And I think the only reason the market is rallying is because people think this is going to be a really short episode. And I pray that they are right. I hope and pray that they're right. But man, the interconnectedness is something I don't think most people understand. And we got to get, we got to get things rolling. At the end of his essay, Reed says, Leave all creative energies uninhibited. Merely organize society to act in harmony with this lesson. Have faith that free men and women will respond. I, pencil, seemingly simple though I am, offer the miracle of my creation as testimony that this is a practical faith. Right? So I think it's a mistake. And he also talks about how people get used to the government having a monopoly over some activity. And he used the mail system as an example in 1958 when he wrote the thing. And he said, they start to believe that only the government can do it. And now I'm afraid they believe that only the government shutting everything down could fix the virus. And that was never true. And a lot of us got it wrong initially. But having gotten it wrong, we owe it to ourselves and everybody else to get it right and sort of unscrew ourselves and, and put things back where they were. So crude oil probably screams back to life, I'm thinking, the price of it anyway. Whether or not the producers, the offshore producers scream back to life is another, is another question. So buying crude oil is not the worst thing you could do, I think, right now. That sounds insane, doesn't it? It sounds absolutely insane. And I talked about the tankers, tanker stocks, like I think we mentioned Scorpio and Euronav and perhaps one other one maybe. Frontline is the one that most of the retail investors like. Yes, it makes sense. They're getting really great day rates on all of their tankers because of the shortage caused by the demand for floating storage. Uh, got it. Yes, sure. And they're going to have a great year regardless from this point. But that situation can reverse. I'm not one to want to go in and buy, buy the daylights out of tanker stocks. I think maybe the best thing you'll get is a further, maybe a 20 or 30 percent, or you know, I don't know, 50 percent, whatever it is, 20, 30, 50 percent surge in the prices of those. But I think at that point, you better sell. These are highly cyclical businesses, as highly cyclical as anything related to any commodity. And they're a second order effect. So when crude oil falls a little bit, the tanker day rates can fall a whole lot. So if they're getting 150, 200,000 a day for a 90 day voyage on an oil tanker, you know, that can go back to 10,000 in a heartbeat. People just don't realize this. They, they don't think, they don't try to see around the corner. And you have to do that now because the situation is so utterly volatile because we've shut everything down. You see? So I think it's probably better at this point to speculate on oil, going long oil, than it is to speculate going long oil tankers, unless you think you're going to be nimble enough to, to get out. As far as the restaurants go, Man, they're tough in the best of times. I'm not one who's going to go take a flyer on restaurants. If you did, though, what I'd want to do is I'd want to look around at a levered restaurant company. I mean, we're talking about a speculation here under the best of circumstances. So you look for a levered restaurant company like Dave & Buster's. Just an example. I'm not saying you should buy it. And think about whether or not that business is going to survive and return to anything like normal because it's so highly levered. I think they've got close to, by the time this is over, I think they'll have more than 2 billion in debt. 1.9 billion was the balance last time I saw their debt balance. So 
So maybe you find something like that and you get a huge pop. I know it got a really big pop off the bottom in March. You know, it went like three or four X in a couple of weeks real quick. So maybe if you think the restaurant business is going to come back, that's a way to do that. Otherwise, you know, you just buy McDonald's or something and and Starbucks and things like that. Things that are going to be great businesses for a very long time. So what do we talk about? Food? Mm, that's a difficult one. I don't want to venture in with a speculation there. I'll tell you what, the only food-related recommendation I, that I've made that I really still like is Dollar General. That thing is up sharply and it's made new highs along with stocks like Walmart, I know Costco has done pretty well, but I know Walmart's made new highs and I know Dollar General's made new highs because, you know, people have to buy food and those are like the cheapest places to buy food, period. And even if there are shortages, they will probably, you know, they know the food supply chain better than anybody, right? Another idea that's been floated to me is something like Beyond Meat, the meat substitute company. So if we have a meat shortage... Well, there's no shortage of peas. That's the vegetable that the that Beyond Meat is based on, pea protein. I think that, again, this seems highly speculative to me because these meat substitutes are really for people, in my view, long term, they're for people who want to get off meat for some reason. They want to be vegetarians. I don't think there's a long term play on people eating a lot less meat. So... You know, if you want to speculate on that due to the meat shortages that Tyson talked about in his letter, that's between you and you and God, you know, <laughs> and you and the market. I have nothing to say about it. I don't think it's a great idea, but it, and it's nothing I would ever do because I, I think the, you know, the economics around, I, I heard a, a, an executive from a pharma company say, the economics around pandemics are not great. <laughs> and that goes for a lot of things. You know, you don't buy things necessarily because the pandemic is going to change everything. We're all going to eat beyond meat from now on. So those are my thoughts about those industries. And we'll probably have more thoughts about more industries as things begin to develop, right? The stories are developing all the time. And we've seen the impact. You've already seen the impact in stocks like Zoom, right? Everybody's home. They're, they're conference calling over the internet, and we've seen impacts on things like, you know, of course, Amazon. And you go to Amazon and they say, hey, you know, your stuff might not get to you as quickly because of this COVID-19. I know we're buying more stuff online than ever, right? I'm sure everybody is. It makes sense. And eventually Amazon, that is a good long-term play because eventually Amazon, I believe, if Prime users are spending, I think, around 1400 a year now, Amazon Prime users, I think eventually it goes more closer to like 10 grand or 14 grand as they take over basically all of the boring parts of your shopping. You know, it goes to some number much higher than that. And that's pretty cool for that business. Okay, that's it. That's my rant for today. Right now, I want to talk with one of my very favorite people in the financial industry, Mr. James Montier. Let's do that right now. Don't get left behind in America's wealth gap. We all know it's growing faster than ever, but you don't have to be on the outside looking in. For the first time ever, one of America's most successful multimillionaires has gone on camera to explain the gap and the three steps to take right now to get on the right side of the trend. Find out who it is and get the facts now about how this new economy works. Watch this important video for free and learn the three important steps to take right now. Go online, growingwealthgap.com. Visit growingwealthgap.com now. James Montier is a member of GMO's asset allocation team. GMO stands for Grantham, Mayo, and Van Otterloo, a very famous Wall Street firm. Prior to joining GMO in 2009, he was co-head of global strategy at Societe Generale, Mr. Montier is the author of several books, including Behavioral Investing, A Practitioner's Guide to Applying Behavioral Finance, Value Investing, Tools and Techniques for Intelligent Investment, and The Little Book of Behavioral Investing. Mr. Montier is a visiting fellow at the University of Durham and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He holds a BA in economics from Portsmouth University 
and a Master of Science in Economics from Warwick University. James Montier, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. James, before we um, talk about your uh, thoughts on the current state of things in the world, I always wonder with my guest, at what point in your life did finance become the sort of obvious career path for you? Uh, that was uh, when I was very young. I, I followed my father's footsteps. So um, my, my dear dad um, was uh, an investment manager uh, long, long ago. And uh, during the, the school holidays and, and college holidays, I used to go and, and work at his firm um, and, and try and help out. Um, and so it was really uh, probably when I was doing my uh, GCSE, so that would have been about the age of 16, um, that I, I kind of really decided that this was what I wanted to do for a living. Um, and um, yeah, the rest is history. What was your first finance gig? Who'd you work for first? Uh, so the very first job I had was um, when I left university, I was um, hired by Kleinwort Benson uh, as a junior economist. Um, and that was in 1992, 19, yeah, 1992. The Pleistocene era. Yes, I remember it well. What did you do there? Just sort of a budding analyst? Yeah, I, I was. Um, I had a variety of, of, of various bits and pieces of jobs, but um, my least favorite was putting together the the calendar of economic events, uh, which back then was was regarded as useful. Um, and I had to look at various countries and work out when their release dates was, which uh, didn't seem like the highest and best calling of, of my uh, my education, but was um, uh, a small price to pay for working alongside some some extraordinary people who taught me an amazing amount about investing, in particular um, a gentleman called Albert Edwards, who I, I spent uh, nearly 18 years working alongside, um, and that was a, a huge pleasure. Yeah, I was going. That was that was sort of where I was headed. Was there anybody? You know, he was obviously, I guess, one of the early people. But was there a breakthrough moment for you? Was there a moment when you said? Hey, I'm going to be a you know a value investor or a behavioral guy. Or was there a moment like that in your career? I, I think there was, and it, it came oddly from from trying to 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 not be those things in many regards. Um, so when I when I started out, I, I was kind of trying to apply economics to the world of, of investing because um, that was kind of the, the natural thing for me to do, given I'd, I'd been a an economist. Um, and what I discovered was it was pretty lousy. I, I, not only wasn't I very good at it, but it didn't really help at all. And what I found was that effectively the, the kind of recommendations and framework that, that um, standard economics offered really wasn't terribly helpful. Um, and in my, my very first um, recommended trade for, uh, for the foreign exchange department, I remember um, suggesting that we, we went short the, the Swedish krona. Um, which eventually came good, but I do also remember the head of the FX division um, <laughs> in my uh, my first week telling me we had managed to lose more on that trade than it uh, it cost to employ me in the year, um, which was not <laughs> saying a lot since I was uh, all of, of 21 or 22 years old, but it was but, a, a, a fairly sobering um, reality check about my abilities to, to time these things. Um, and so in the wake of all of that, I, I kind of began to, to wonder why it was that what I'd been taught really wasn't working. Um, and that's where people like Albert Edwards and um, uh, Frank Venoroso, um, Andrew Hunt, uh, Rob uh, Parento, um, we were all within the, the same um, essential Kleinwartz um, and Dresdner organization. Um, and I, I was able to learn from them a lot more about the way the world actually worked as opposed to what I've been told. Um, and it, it began to dawn on me that really, Economics was was largely a, a failed subject because it it proclaimed to be um, a study of of the way that people behaved, but actually was all of the behaviour in economics is assumed. Everyone is assumed to be rational, um, and that that began the the, the cogs turning in, in to what was become uh, my interest in in behavioural uh, science, which was really kind of the well that doesn't sound like a good description of the way that that people actually behave. Um, and so I, I began to look at the way that people did behave, um, and that kind of made a lot more sense to me. And I was then able to, to kind of apply that to markets. Um, and then from there, thinking about why it was that people behaved in a certain fashion, it came to me to think about, well, how do I take that knowledge of, of how people behave and, and apply it to investing? And is there a way of investing that that kind of mitigates a lot of those behavioral biases? 
Um, and it turns out that um, value investing, at least in, in my opinion, is is the solution to those those kind of behavioral biases. Um, and so I, I, I transitioned from kind of hardcore believer in in maths and 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 uh, and finance and, and economics to uh, behavioral psychology to to value investing. You know, James, this interview for me, it's a little personal because you're just one of the people I've always wanted to speak with. And I'm glad you've broached the twin topics of behavioral and, and value. I myself am a, a value investor. I would call myself a diehard value investor, which if there are any left in the year 2020, they would have to be diehard. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Hardcore. <laughs> yeah. So here's my struggle that I want to talk about a little bit. And I'm pretty sure our listener has this same struggle because we're all human beings after all. I've read books and I've read your stuff. I've read quite a good chunk of behavioral investing. And then I've read all of the little book of behavioral investing a couple of times. And I've read other behavioral books and things. And what strikes me is that my hope was that the more I learn about this stuff, the more I can sort of get rid of it. But it seems the more I focus on it, the worse it gets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, or at least it, it's not going anywhere. You know what I'm saying? But luckily, I, I believe you're correct. You know, you, you can't eliminate this stuff. But I guess you'd, you'd agree with me that like learning to buy cheap is kind of a start. I think you said that in a recent piece, something like that in, yeah, in one of your latest pieces at GMO.com. Right, exactly. Is there something? I, I just want some inspiration, I guess. <laughs> I really I'm begging you for inspiration here. Like, is what what good is studying these biases if I can't get rid of the damn things? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. So um, let, let me recap on, on something you said earlier about yeah the diehard nature of of, of what we do. Uh, I gave a presentation I guess it was the year or two ago on and uh, wrapped in um, Star Wars and I'm I'm an old Star Wars addict and and still uh, loving Star Wars to this day. I was six years old when it first came out and it, it had a formative impact on my life. And I gave an entire presentation on the relationship between Star Wars, uh, the force and value investing. Uh, and there was a line in, in Star Wars, uh, where Grand Moff Tarkin is talking to Darth Vader. Um, and, uh, he, he says to Darth, um, of the Jedi, you are all that is left of their sad religion, my friend. And that, that's kind of how I feel about value investors. There, there's only a handful of us left in existence. Um, we're a definite dying species, uh, but it, it strikes me that you're absolutely right. And and um, Danny Kahneman and, and Amos Tversky, two of the huge founding fathers uh, in the field of behavioral science and and uh, the study of, of decision making under uncertainty, um, also observed that they they too suffered these problems. And I think it was Amos who said um, his only advantage was that he he knew what to call the mistakes he made. Um, and I think that's, that's true because ultimately we're all human beings, uh, and we can't stop being human beings, but there is something we can do, which is a, a prescription, um, from the field of psychology, which is if you cannot de-bias, then re-bias. So you're absolutely right. It is impossible to stop us being human and being human is what creates these, these behavioral biases in the first place. But can we turn them to our advantage? And that, to me, is where investment process comes in and having a sensible investment process, which is what value investing is all about, really comes to the fore. So if we can't force ourselves to stop making mistakes, how do we turn the mistakes we will make to our advantage? So let's take um, anchoring as a really good example. Anchoring is, is clinging to, to random inputs. Um, so uh, there have been experiments done on uh, getting judges to roll dice before they sentence people. Uh, and their, their, their um, term of the sentence that they issue has been influenced by the roll of the dice, despite the fact that that roll of the dice was clearly uh, completely arbitrary um, and should have had no impact on them. It did. So we know that people will cling to, to random inputs. So the question is, you know, how do you, you learn to look at inputs that make sense? And so to me, value investing is, is kind of behavioral self-defense 101. It says things like the, the way that we do it in NASA allocation at GMO, we have a valuation framework. And that is absolutely key because it's, it's our anchor. So on days when the world is falling apart, you know, 2008, 2009, early part of 2009, um, you know, a few weeks ago, 
um, the world seemed to be falling apart and, and everybody's panicking and you pick up the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times and no scenario is, is too pessimistic enough. And it's incredibly hard to, to resist that, that, um, that sense of, of fear. Um, it, it's almost palpable. Uh, but at the same time, you then say, well, hang on, I've got my valuation discipline. And so, hey, look, I'm looking at assets that are returning potentially, uh, in expectation at least, double digits uh, in terms of, of rates of real return. How can I not own these things? And having that is a really good um, self-defense mechanism. It forces you to, to say, OK, look, I know I'm human. I know I'm feeling the fear. But, geez, I've got to be really confident that that fear is going to be absolutely realized because look at the the returns I'm I'm potentially getting. And so to me, designing an investment process that is uh, as robust as it can be and designed to really um, take the behavioral errors we're going to make and turn them to our advantage is, is really what um, the, the kind of application of behavioral finance to, to investing is, is really all about. And to me, it, it, is, it just fits so perfectly with that, that value-based framework. I want to go back and talk about anchoring because I, I just want to make explicit for our listener, there's a classic example of this, I think. Someone finds a stock at $10. They see it was at 5 earlier and they say, oh, it's already doubled. It's too late. And then there's the other thing where they find the stock at 10 they see it was at 15 and they say, oh, it's, it's worth 15. It's destined to go back to 15. I think the anchoring on a previous price like that, I know that many listeners are nodding their heads. I should be nodding my head. I've done it. It's very difficult not to do it. But you're saying if we stick with valuation, that will help you know, alleviate this problem. But of course, the comeback, I'll just be the devil's advocate. I'll be the typical, you know, homo mistakus, you <laughs> called him, uh, you know, in the little book of behavioral investing, which is a great book. Everyone listening should read it. And the typical guy would say, oh, well, but that doesn't mean it can't get cheaper, right? If you value something, you think it's a good deal, that doesn't mean it can't get cheaper. So then this is where the fortitude comes in. And this is a topic I return to because it seems to me like value investing, at some point, it's going to boil down to this. You know, it's going to boil down to having the courage over your convictions, which was practically a, a phrase straight out of Ben Graham, right? The courage of your convictions. Where does that courage come from, in your opinion? And, and do you agree that it comes down to that? I do agree with that. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and... I think Sir John Templeton actually had some insights here. Um, Sir John pointed out um, that we were very bad emotional time travelers. So we weren't good at predicting how we were going to feel uh, at various points in time. So what he used to do was do his analysis and his work on quiet days when nothing was happening. When he turned his, his computers off, he was just focused on valuing a stock. He'd, he'd do his valuation. Uh, he'd look at what he'd come up with, and then he would place a limit order in the market at that price, because he knew that what would happen on the day when, let's say, uh, his his favorite stock had, had fallen halved, let's say, he would never have the, the courage of his convictions. Um, and so by having that limit order already out there, that limit buy order, if the stock had got to that price, he'd buy it. It took that that ability to override that, that um, emotional impact of that day completely out of the equation. Um, and so one of the ways you can you can have the courage of convictions is to do exactly something like that, is to have a battle plan to say, OK, look, here's what I think the stock is worth. Here is my analysis. Geez, it's, it's you know, half that or double that. Um, and then act accordingly. But do your analysis not in the heat of the moment, because when you're in the heat of the moment, you, you find all of those um, emotional influences are at their very worst. Um, and that, that's the nature of the beast. Emotion is is wired into the way that, that we function to force us to, to act in a certain way um, and to act in, the, in what is often a, not a rational approach, but is a life-saving one. And this is something that I think is, in, is key for investors to understand, that our brains are shaped by a process of evolution that takes hundreds of thousands of years. Um, we're basically designed for life on the African savannah of 150,000 years ago. Um, not the industrial age of 300 years ago, let alone the information age of today. And so 
our brains are, you know, imagine you're, you're walking uh, across a savannah and, and you, you spot a, a twig um, and, and you think, oh, that could be a snake. I'll give it a wide berth. That's fine. Um, and in an evolutionary sense, it makes a great deal of sense because if you, if you get that wrong, the, the consequences are pretty damn fatal. If you tread on the snake and it bites you, you're, you're pretty much evolutionary toast. Um, whereas if you, you give it a wide berth and it was a stick, okay, fine. It wasn't optimal, but it was, it was good enough. You did well, you survived. Um, and so the brain is often designed to let emotions, um, do their, do their job. Uh, they have like a, a fast circuit an override, if you like. Um, and bypassing that is, is hard in the, in the, the fleeting instance. And so I think it, Having a process, having a methodology, doing your work on the quiet days when nothing is happening is absolutely one of the ways you can get comfortable with having the courage of your convictions and then being able to act on them. And it, it's those two things that I think have to come together to allow us to behave in a certain fashion. It sounds like you only come to work on the weekends these days, James. <laughs> <laughs> I try and avoid work at all times, if I'm honest, man. <laughs> my, my least favorite four-letter word. Yes. So. I guess where I'm left then, this is not for everyone. This value investing, managing your own money, having your own process, needing to figure out how you're going to have the fortitude to ride out the inevitable drawdowns and mistakes, frankly, it ain't for everybody, is it? It just isn't for everybody. No, absolutely. It takes a certain type of person. And I've actually hypothesized that there's something kind of odd about value investors. Uh, and I say that as one. Well. Um, but it, it's kind of interesting that there are some studies about um, social behavior and, and brain function, um, and also they, they relate to pain. And it turns out that um, the parts of the brain that react to real physical pain, having your arm broken, are exactly the same parts of the brain that react to social exclusion, doing something different. And as a value investor, you are inherently going to be doing excuse me, doing something different. You are going to be buying what others are selling and selling what others are buying. So you're, you're going to be going against the crowd. That is the nature of the beast. Well, it turns out that that's a little bit like having your arm broken on a regular basis. So I think in some ways, value investors are kind of financial masochists. We, we just like the pain. Um, and that clearly is really not for everybody. Clearly not. I'm glad you mentioned this this bit about liking the pain and, and the pain. We're, we're having a conversation about fear and pain. And of course, you wrote this really neat piece dated March 25th, 2020 on the GMO website called Fear and the Psychology of Bear Markets. And it makes a very similar point to what you just said. Basically, the point is when people just got hurt in the market, they kind of don't want to be in the market anymore. And that tends to be a mistake. And yet, brain damaged people like you and me, we keep coming back for more. Yeah, right. Exactly. It makes all the difference. You know, I talked to a fellow who's part of one of our affiliate companies, a guy named Enrique Abeta. He was making the point, he said, yeah, you know, one of the reasons Warren Buffett is so successful is because he's almost 90 or he's 90, I guess now. And all you got to do is stay in the market for decades and decades and decades and not be scared out of it. And you should do pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's one of the the colories of being a value investor. Um, the the uh, we've already touched on it. You, you mentioned earlier that there is nothing that stops a, a cheap stock or, or market getting cheaper, and an expensive stock or market getting more expensive. Um, and valuation is an incredibly useful long term signal and a pretty terrible short term one. There is nothing that stops a cheap stock getting cheaper or a, or a more expensive stock getting more expensive. Um, and so if you're going to be a value-based investor, you are going to need to have a long time horizon. Um, and of course, everybody says they're, they have a long time horizon right up until you hit that first period of poor performance. Uh, and then suddenly it's like, well, what did you do yesterday? And I'm like, well, but you said you were long term. Uh, well, yes, but you know, this times are challenging. We need to we need to focus on the short term. Um, and so there's this this insane habit of of trying to always shrink time horizons. And I think we talked about how the brain was was potentially not um, well suited to the information age. Uh, one of the the, the 
side effects of the information age is is definitely a kind of increase in, in short-termism. Uh, Maynard Keynes talked about it um, in the general theory. He talked about um, how uh, he had come to believe that investing should be like a marriage, you know, permanent and indissoluble except under extreme circumstances. Uh, but he didn't think that very many people behaved like that because they were all focused on the short term. Uh, and that was written in the 1930s. Um, fast forward to today, and it, it's it's just uh, that situation writ even larger. Um, and that's a real, real challenge for any investor, I think, is how to maintain that focus on the long term. You know, one thing I realized is the difference. I, mean, I mentioned Buffett just being older, but another key difference seems to me like most people want money. They don't want equity. But Buffett, he wants to own those equities and he wants to own them forever. He doesn't want money. He wants to be an equity owner. And I think it's so difficult for the average person to look at it that way and say, you know, the average human being, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just acknowledging humanity. I'm not talking down to anyone. It's so difficult for someone to say, yeah, I really want to own these equities. What they really want to do is make money. Absolutely. The idea of making money running counter to success in the stock market just sounds crazy to me. It's another sort of crazy counterintuitive thing that you have to figure out about yourself. You have to know yourself very well, don't you, to do all this? Absolutely, yeah. And I, I, um, that, I think that's exactly right. And Ben Graham, uh, you know, obviously uh, Warren Buffett's mentor, always talked about how um, a share was a share of ownership. It was a share in a business. Um, it, it wasn't just a bit of paper. And yet today, I think everybody sees it exactly as you say, as, as little bits of paper, not even bits of paper anymore. Now they're just um, ticks on a screen, right? It's, um, we, we don't even have uh, paper-based trading anymore. So it's, um, it's, it's a world in which it is very hard, I think, for people to remember that you are buying a, a share of, of a series of cash flows from a business. And you know, if you ask a, a businessman how they would value another business, um, that they would take a long-term view. You know, they're not looking at the next quarter's earnings. Um, that would be insane for them to try and do that. They they look at the the expected cash flows over a very long time period in exactly the same way as a value investor does. And so, value investors and business owners have uh, a lot more in common than than uh, most in most of those people who who purport to be investors. And I, I think that term is is overused. An investor. To me, you know, we, we talk about value investing. I'm like, what other sort of investing is there? Almost everything else to me is some form of speculation. Um, and, but you, you don't see many people lining up to have the words chief speculative officer embroidered on their business cards. <laughs> uh, right. but, but it does seem to me that, that that would be a better description of most of them than chief investment officer. Right. And we talk about all these biases and things and all these problems. And we come down to... Um, well, what is essentially chapter 16 of your book, The Behavioral Investing, process, 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 the one thing you can control. And I feel like one ought to be, if you want to be obsessed with something, don't be obsessed with the stock prices ticking up and down. Become obsessed with the process by which you go about choosing and managing investments. Is there anything by way of general outline or insight that you can offer us about the nature of having a good process or, or the, maybe a description? What does a good process look like? And, you know, for an individual investor, I, I don't if it's different from an institutional one, I don't really know. Yeah, I think it, it probably is. But the the I think the individual has one potential significant advantage, which is they are unlikely to fire themselves. Um, and the institutional world is, is constantly hounded because it acts as a, a reinforcing mechanism uh, on our behavioral biases. So not only are we kind of primed to want to be part of the herd and look the same as everybody else from a, um, a psychological point of view, um, but the institutional world then layers that on because you know, Keynes talked it uh, perfectly in, in that chapter 12 of the general theory where he talks about uh, what Jeremy has called career risk, um, which is it's better for reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. Um, and so the easiest way to get fired in investment is, is to be wrong alone or to be um, out on your own with a different set of results and, and have the markets move against you. So I think the individual has 
one inert uh, advantage, um, which uh, I think um, is is important um, and and should be uh, utilized. But it, it, it's kind of hard to do. So, how does an individual go about having a good process? Well, I think it it, it comes back to that point you made, which is you have to know yourself and. Um, I think it was in the little book I used the quote that you know you are your 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 own worst enemy, um, and that is certainly true. And so I think uh, an individual has to sit down and say, what are my most um, lightly mistakes? Uh, and so this is where that knowledge of, of behavioural psychology really does come in because it's okay. So what what are the things I'm guilty of? Uh, is it uh, overconfidence? Is it um, over optimism? Is it loss aversion? Is it um, extrapolation? Um, there, there are all, you know, a whole gamut of potential biases that we will suffer. Um, and so identifying the, the, the one you are most familiar with, the one you, you probably think you make the most, um, is really important because then and only then can you begin to think about how can I build a process that is robust to that mistake? How do I say, okay, let's, um, Let's uh, let's take a, an example. So let's say um, I, I'm doing um, some sort of uh, DCF. I'm doing a, a dividend discount model uh, for a stock, um, and uh, most people tend to be over optimistic and, and and overconfident. And so what they do is they 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 write down their growth expectations. They put they they crank the numbers through the the dividend discount model, and they come up with uh, a number that is uh, let's say above the stock price. So um, rather than following that particular problem if you are knowing if you know yourself to be over optimistic in nature then i think there's a a way you can turn that on its head and say okay so rather than um starting with my forecast what i should do is take the market price and back out what's implied so reverse engineer my dividend discount model and say okay what growth is implied by the stock price today then let me have a think about how likely it is that that stock uh, is going to generate that kind of growth, um, and that reframing of the problem, um, I think, can can often help um, mitigate some of the the behavioural biases that we otherwise kind of blunder into somewhat blindly. I'm really glad you said that. I write a newsletter called Extreme Value, and that is exactly how we proceed. It prevents you having to predict so much, right, and forecast so much. It's great. Exactly, exactly. And prediction is one of those sort of areas where we are, are really poor. Um, it, forecasting is, is, yeah, not a good idea. Um, it, we, we tend to get very overconfident, very overenthusiastic, and, or, or we simply extrapolate. So if the world is falling apart, and, you know, it works both, both ends of the spectrum. At the peak, you want to extrapolate, and you know, we end up with, in 2000, Cisco needing to, to have sales growth that was going to make it larger than the entire planet Earth to, to, to make it worth its while. Um, and similarly, in in uh, the other end of the spectrum, you know, uh, in 2008, no scenario is too pessimistic. You know, uh, the world could end tomorrow, and people are sitting there nodding, saying, "Yes, you're right, it could." Um, and so there's this is terrible habit of, of extrapolating at, at, at both peak and trough. Um, and so taking that away and saying, "Look, you know, at the peak, yes, Cisco has to grow to be. Uh, we have to develop interstellar kind of trade if Cisco is going to live up to its expectations." Uh, and similarly, at the, the 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 kind of lows of 2008, you're looking there and saying, "Geez, you know, is is Microsoft really going to contract at the rate that, that's being priced in here? It's it's insane." So turning that on its head and using that that reverse engineered approach, I think, is is incredibly sound. Yes, it and it it fights against that recency bias that you wrote about in that recent piece I mentioned on on GMO.com extrapolating what happened yesterday into the into the future infinitely out in time forever exactly right yeah it's hard though is i mean on what was it march 23rd of this year you know that was the the bottom so far of the current episode and i can't imagine even 10 percent of everyone within the sound of my voice wasn't saying oh my god what is happening next i know i was saying something like that i thought i was pretty good at this but it happens so fast, so utterly fast. It was a little scary. It's hard to do that. It's hard to do it when everyone is, you know, shopping for new underwear, <laughs> to put it mildly. You're you're going to sit there and say, oh, 
uh, well, isn't this all very nice? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fix myself a drink and, and take a look at the valuations. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it's inhuman. It's 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 superhuman. <laughs> it it does make us sound a bit like Spock, right? Um, and now we've drifted from Star Wars to Star Trek. But um, you're you're spotting a common theme in, in the things that I like here. Right? I happen to be an old sci-fi nerd, but um, but it it is it is that kind of discipline. It's saying, okay, look, it it is, and and rest assured that that during the the the, the recent lows, I too was panicking because I'm like, this is this is different, and it was different for me because. Um, at previous times, like 2000 and, and 2008, um, to me had been, uh, they hadn't been black swans. They'd been gray swans. Or, or actually, you know, honestly, they were white swans. They were bloody great white swans that anybody should have been able to see coming if only they'd thought carefully about them. Um, because there was an unsustainable economic process at work. Um, whereas the, the most recent uh, crisis, the, the, the COVID situation, is genuinely, I think, much more of a black swan. Um, certainly to me, it was something I hadn't seen. It was out of the blue. It was not something that um, it was unsustainable in, in economic nature. Uh, and that made it hard to, 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 to cope with. But ultimately, I, I sat there and I, I wrote that piece on, on fear and psychology of bear markets because I was sitting there thinking, well, ultimately, let, let's say this wipes out a year's worth of earnings. Does that really matter? Uh, in the the long term scale of things, and it wasn't obvious that it did. Uh, it would have been incredibly unpleasant, and, and it still could be very unpleasant. I have no idea whether the market has bottomed or not. Um, but I think you know it goes back to kind of Howard Marks's wonderful um, uh, dichotomy of of investors: the I know investors versus the I don't know investors. Um, and, and value investors, by and large, are, are firmly in the I don't know. Um, and so we, we spend a lot of time saying, I don't know, which is not very satisfying as, as an answer to a question, uh, but is ultimately much more honest. Um, but it does mean you have to behave in a certain way and, and you insist on, on Ben Graham's margin of safety. And so in, in the, the heart of that, that, that downturn, as COVID was uh, COVID fear, at least, was, was gripping the world, I was sitting there saying, well, look, you know, these assets are cheap. And, and one of the, my jobs when I joined GMO um, uh, over a decade ago now, one of the things Jeremy asked me to do was was to bang the table when things got cheap. And so I, I was sat there banging the table um, because to my mind, things were were looking cheap. Um, I've, I've been surprised by how quickly they have recovered in some cases. Um, and I have no idea how sustainable that is or not. But it, um, it was certainly a very different experience from, from my perspective. Well said. We're actually coming to the end of our time here. Went by so quickly. But if I could ask you, if you could leave our listener with just one thought about all this, or about anything at all, about sci-fi, about if you have, if you could leave our listener with just one thought, what might that be today, James? Oh man, that's a, that's a really challenging question, isn't it? Um, I think it would be have the courage to maintain your faith in your framework. Uh, whatever that framework is, stick to it. Um, don't be led astray, to borrow Ben Graham's phrase, uh, by by Wall Street's fads and fashions. I think that is the, the tremendous tendency is to want to go along with what everybody else is saying, but have have the willingness to be different, dare to be different. Um, and that, to me, is is ultimately the the heart of of what value investing is really all about. Excellent. That is an excellent final thought. I know you said it's a difficult question, but you you kind of nailed it. I sure would like to speak with you again sometime. You're you're. I have to say, I, I'm kind of a fanboy. I I read your stuff and I've enjoyed reading your stuff for years. And and I hope you'll come back and talk with us sometime. I would be absolutely delighted to, Dan. It would be my pleasure. And thank you very much for having me. Yes, thank you for making time for us. But I guess it's adios for now. Stay safe and, uh, you know, wash your hands <laughs> and take care of yourself. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, maybe that, maybe that should be my final piece of advice, shouldn't it, really? Wash your hands. That would have been the, uh, that would have been the ultimate sign-off. That's what I should have said. If only I thought about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, every, that's everybody's final sign-off today. All right, thanks a lot, James. Uh, keep well. Look after yourself. All right, bye-bye.
All right. Well, that was a lot of fun. James is what, like I said, he's one of my favorite people in finance. I definitely recommend that you read every word of the little book of behavioral investing, how not to be your own worst enemy by James Montier. It is an excellent, excellent book. And you'll keep coming back to it. I keep coming back to it. Wow. Okay. Let's go see what's in the mailbag today. Privacy policy and terms and conditions are posted at textrules.us. Texting rules for occurring automated marketing messages by text. Message and data rates may apply. What's the number one retirement stock in America right now? Whitney Tilson, the man CNBC called the prophet, is sharing the biggest investment prediction of his career. Tilson predicted the dot-com crash, the housing crisis, and in 2008 on 60 Minutes, he called the bottom of the stock market just before the longest bull market ever. And today, in a completely free online presentation, he tells you exactly where to put your money this year and the name of what he calls America's number one retirement stock. Buy this stock immediately. Go online to TilsonRadio.com. That's T-I-L-S-O-N Radio.com. There, watch a free online video describing the retirement secret that's made headlines in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. An investment he's so confident in, he says he'd put 50% of his kid's college fund into this stock and never lose a minute of sleep. Buy the stock immediately. Again, just visit TilsonRadio.com to get the name of this stock for free or text Tilson to 246810 and discover America's number one retirement stock today. Text T-I-L-S-O-N to 246810. Six eight ten. This is the favorite part of my week sometimes, man. It's so much fun. This is where we get to have an honest conversation about investing and whatever else is on your mind. You write in to feedback at investorhour.com with comments, questions, and politely worded criticisms. Thank you. And I will read every single email that you send me, every word of every single one, and I'll respond to as many as I possibly can. We got lots of good ones, lots of long ones again this week. We've gotten lots of long ones. I think people are stuck at home with the coronavirus. They're just typing away on the feedback emails. But we got, we got a good one here to start out with. This is Joe V., Joe V says, hi, Dan, just finished listening, have never missed one of your podcasts, wanted to keep my feedback as concise as possible, but I've never disagreed more with one of your guests on so many points. He's talking about Enrique Abeta from last week. Point number one, he says, Lehman had zero to do with the 2008 crisis. And then his response to that is portraying Lehman as a victim of financialization instead of an architect is laughable at best and disingenuous at worst. Hard to reconcile Enrique's view with the advice he received at age 22 about being honest, black and white, etc. Number two, stocks, Enrique said, stocks are not necessarily ownerships in businesses. And Joe says, only if you trade in and out of them. Big difference in trading versus investing. Number three. Enrique called Buffett a growth investor. And Joe says, not really. His biggest advantage, like Enrique correctly pointed out, is every investor's biggest potential advantage, time. When Buffett purchased Coke, it was not a high growth company. It was a slow, steady grower with a wide moat and brand loyalty and a consistent growing dividend. Never forget the rule of 72. If it pays a 3% yield, Buffett is doubling his investment every 24 years, irrespective of share price. Compounding for Buffett is achieved by time in the investment more than intrinsic growth rate. Simply one way to get rich versus buying a high growth stock, which a huge addressable market slash long runway that does not pay a dividend because profits are reinvested in the business. Example, Shopify. Number four, this is his last point. I like his parting thought about having a positive attitude about life, but when applied to investing, which is after all the focus of your podcast, it is diametrically opposed to your via negativa. He says it's more important to take the plunge with an investment than it is to find reasons not to invest, emphasizing upside versus risk. I'm sure you held your tongue there based on what you said in episode 150 about surviving. Stay well. Best regards, Joe V. A lot of great points here. I could We couldn't not put this letter on. Thank you, Joe. This is a great email. Point number one. Enrique said Lehman had zero to do with the 2008 crisis. Yeah, I, I think that his point was that Lehman did not cause the crisis. It participated, right? And I frankly, I don't know. I'd have to get with Enrique again and talk to him about the difference between participated in and caused. But the bigger point here is something that was raised by another reader. I did. There were a couple of emails about this who said, 
To say that Lehman made 250 great decisions and the 251st was the one that tanked the company, but, and otherwise it was a great company, it didn't make any sense to him. And, and he was a doctor writing in and he said, you know, I make 150 decisions, the 151st kills the patient. And I go, oh, well, you know, I make great decisions mostly. I don't agree with that viewpoint either. Stocks are not ownerships and businesses. Uh, you're right. I agree with you, Joe. If you trade in and out of them, they're not. Over the long term, they absolutely are. And even in the short term, the fact that people trade in and out of them doesn't mean they're not part ownership of a business. And Enrique, I remember his answer. He said, it is an ownership of a business if you think of it this way, this way, this way, this way. <laughs> I didn't completely get that either. He's a smart guy. He's, he's way smarter than me, and I didn't understand everything he said. But then he called Buffett a growth investor. And Joe, I think you're suggesting that a growth investor means he buys high growth companies. I don't think that's what he meant at all. I think that growth investor plus this time advantage you're talking about, that's the same thing in Enrique's view. I think you guys actually agree here on Buffett and that you're just kind of maybe having a little quibble with, with terms on each other. I really do think you're talking about the same thing. Number four, and you said you liked his positive attitude about life is different from my view, which is the via negativa, which, which the negative way, avoiding. The, the learning of life is about what to avoid. Nassim Taleb calls that the negative way in Latin via negativa. No, I think you avoid bad businesses and you avoid businesses that can't grow for a long time. I, do, I don't think that having a positive attitude means that you can't exploit the negative way. I don't think they're, they're diametrically opposite at all. Exploiting the, the negative way, acknowledging that the learning of life is about what to avoid, does not preclude one from having a very positive attitude about life. I like to believe that I have a very positive attitude about life. But then you said specifically that he says it's more important to take the plunge with an investment than it is to find reasons not to invest, emphasizing upside versus risk. I think if you actually look at his portfolio, his risk control is much more prominent than what you're representing there. And maybe even what he said. Yeah, I, I heard a little bit of that too, but I, I think we're, we, we can't extrapolate too much from what Enrique said. I, he's a really good investor. And if you're a long-term investor in equities, I think what he said is absolutely correct. It's more important to stay in the market over the long term than it is to find reasons to get out because you're afraid. Joe V, thank you. Excellent email. Loved every bit of it. Lots to talk about. Next, we have Raphael T. Raphael T says, Dear Dan, I enjoy your weekly podcast and all the various topics you cover. In light of the oil markets getting so much attention with negative futures prices last week, I recently read that OPEC, Russia, and China are trying to break the U.S. oil markets by flooding the world with oil. Eventually, their goal is to swap the petrodollar for the petro yuan. Presently, with oil trading in dollars, is it not true that most countries hold dollars to buy oil, and if this swap occurred, those U.S. dollars would flood back to the U.S., devastating the value of our currency? I'm reading figures like the entire U.S. economy holds about $1.5 trillion, and this would add 6 or $7 trillion as those countries swap their dollars for yuan. Is this something we should be worried about? Another reason to own physical gold, Raphael T. I am absolutely not worried about this one bit. There is a dollar funding hole in the world that is, I don't know, Ray Dalio says maybe $15 trillion worldwide outside the U.S. That's a demand for 15 trillion. That's a lot of emerging market debt that is getting murdered right now that needs to be serviced, rolled over, something. It's just creating a huge demand for dollars. I'm not worried about this problem, not even the tiniest bit. Almost, you know how much global trade settles in yuan? It's like diddly squat, nothing. They won't let their dollars out of the country. US companies can't get their dollars out of the country. It's it's weird. So, yeah, I, I'm not worried about this at all. But very good question. We have one from Gary D. Gary and I follow each other on Twitter. He's a kind of a longtime podcast listener. Nice to hear from you again, Gary. He says, he said a lot of other stuff, but this is the part I can print. Not because the other stuff was bad, just because it was long. I should tell you, this is a friend of his asking him this question. He's passing it along to us. All right. With the inundation of news every day on the government's action to help people, I can't help 
but wonder where all the money is coming from. Is the federal government borrowing from state governments, or are they printing money? If yes, how will inflation be kept in check? When there is already a very high deficit, how are these programs funded? And then Gary says, that's his friend's question. Gary says, I actually thought this was a very good question. The inflation part you have discussed frequently since 2008, all this new money hasn't seemed to create massive inflation as expected. But the actual process by which the U.S. government creates money out of thin air is still a bit of a mystery to me. Perhaps you can provide a brief blow by blow of the money creation process and how this process accumulates as part of the national debt. Thanks. Take care and please stay safe. As my friend Clive Cussler once told me, us old guys, we got to stick together, Gary D. He's friends with Clive Cussler, the author. Pretty impressive. Okay, so I don't know about a blow by blow, Gary, but you can go to YouTube and you can Google Ben Bernanke, mark up the account. Ben Bernanke, mark up the account. That will take you to a 60 Minutes episode with Bernanke. And he says right there in the interview, we mark up the account. In other words, that's how they print money. They, we use the computer to mark up the account, he says. So that's, your, that's the big mystery about money creation right there. The other mechanism is the Federal Reserve uses the computer to mark up the account, and then they buy treasuries. That's the mechanism. And that's deficit funding right there. And yes, it just the U.S. government just borrows it. They borrow the difference. And they borrow more and more and more and more. And the Fed buys more and more and more. And that's that's the big mystery. That's that I don't know about the blow by blow. I'm sure there's, you know, different steps along the process, but that's it. Use the computer, mark up the account, buy treasuries, rinse and repeat. And, you know, they spend however much they want. And you can hear comments every now and then by Fed governor, you know, there's no we're not going to run out of money. We have infinite resources. We're not going to run out of money. And that's what they mean. And the fact that this has not caused really bad inflation doesn't mean that it won't cause bad inflation at some point. You know, look, whether it causes inflation or not, you know, you just do things like own gold and silver just as a hedge and an insurance policy because you don't trust these people. <laughs> That's what's rational and reasonable. But great question, though. The questions around money printing and inflation are much better than we ever thought they were because of this mechanism that we explained previously where the Fed prints a dollar and then they buy a dollar worth of bonds and they basically unprinted the dollar worth of bonds, which is a deflationary effect. It takes income out of the system and it doesn't finance anything. You know, It doesn't inflate the, the price of anything except for the bond and most of them are treasuries. So at this point, they are starting to buy junk bond ETFs, CLOs, collateralized loan obligations. So, you know, maybe we're getting there. But again, the deflationary effect will probably go on longer than you, you think. Great questions. Great topic. We'll, we'll probably revisit it often and until we see real inflation, right? We'll keep having to revisit this. Okay, folks, that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Do me a favor. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow the show with a rate and a review. And if you have any ideas about a guest that you'd like to hear me interview, just drop us a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. Until next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.